Oh, thank you, everybody. Uh, excuse the profanities in advance, and uh, let's get started. So the title of my talk is Spooky Authentication, well, Spooky Authentication at a Distance, uh, aka why I don't care about your passwords. So let's start about me. Uh, I have a day job and a night job. I'm working in two shifts. Uh, day job is at a boutique pen test company called Seconds Alt. It's uh, like we are mostly prevalent in uh, Europe and Asia, uh, not much here in the States. And uh, I am from the Swiss division. So I'm working at Switzerland. Uh, my night job, I run under the ali alias of Scalsec. Uh, I am an open source developer. I have a lot of open source tools uh, created over the years and published mostly under MIT license. And I'm a member, or a proud member of Porchetta Industries or Porchetta Industries for some of the audiences. And uh, we have an awesome logo over there. So uh, biggest project maybe that you might have heard of is uh, PyPyCats. Anybody has heard of PyPyCats? Anybody's using it? Nice, nice. Thank you. And uh, also, I have a tendency of uh, rewriting libraries for my own amusement. So AIO SMB is basically in packet, rewritten from scratch. Uh, MSLDAP is like my own LDAP library. And uh, I have like Kerberos, NTLM, SSH, whatever. I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of networking protocols, if one can tell. And yeah, all of these are open source, except for Octopon. Octopon is a special project. And actually, while developing Oct Octopon, uh, I started uh, looking a bit into like um, nested things that one can do with uh, Windows integrated authentication. And hence, this talk, uh, hence this talk was born. Uh, or, yeah, also, I like to just go and ramble about everything. So. I have a promise for you today, or this afternoon. Uh, this present, in this presentation, you will see a novel technique that will allow you to basically, uh, if you manage to execute code in a user context of uh, machine A, then from machine B, which is like your machine, the attacker machine, you will be able to perform authentication in the context of user A, uh, but from or the, uh, from your own target machine. This means that it will basically, the code, like the attacking code itself, is going to be executed on your machine. And hopefully, you haven't installed XDR or AV or whatever on your machine, because why would you? Uh, this will allow you to, if you manage to uh, sufficiently hide the proxy binary, and I will. I will give you some hints on how you can how you can do that. It's a really small proxy uh, binary. Then, then you're basically golden because uh, you usually don't really necessarily care about the uh, the initial point of compromise. So, like you don't really care about like what is on the HR machine or the HR lady who double clicked on the the spam that you crafted. You are mostly caring about like what is on the servers uh, and like over SMB or LDAP. Uh, that you can reach using the uh, HR person's authentication context, right? So, uh, in summary, I'm going to talk about first, like, uh, just a, a brief overview, um, like a really gentle overview of Windows authentication protocol. Uh, this is going to be in a test tomorrow, so I hope that you are going to take notes. Um, a general description. Uh, um, we are going to use LDAP in, as an example, and I'm going to like take your hand and walk you through on how uh, NTLM, Kerberos uh, plays together with SPNego, and uh, but we are just going to skim over. And I have two demos for you, not live demos, because uh, uh, I'm not. They told me I'm not really allowed to plug in random USB sticks on uh, <laughs> on this machine. Uh, we are going to talk about SSPI and basically the how to authenticate locally, but remotely, but also locally part. So, Windows authentication protocols in a nutshell. 
uh, before, before, this, uh, before this first uh, slide about authentication protocol, one thing that I want to mention is most of the people that I, uh, that I talk about, uh, that, that I talk with about authentication protocol, uh, they have this weird notion that like the authentication uh, protocol basically stops being useful after you perform the authentication itself and uh, basically it's either a yes or no decision whether you get access to the resource or not from the server. Uh, however, I would like to point out, and I'm going to point it out multiple times, that it is not the case because usually modern authentication protocols also do key exchange and you will have to do something with the, with the encryption and decryption uh, key context. So, uh, yeah, as I said, there is going to be a lot of letters. Uh, no worries if you don't, uh, if you cannot read it. I, oh, it's actually quite readable. I was really afraid of this one. Uh, <clears throat> so. Basically, we, we take like a random network protocol, generic overview, uh, client would like to log into the server. How to do this? Like if you, would, if you would be willing or if you wish to implement your own custom protocol and you would like to have some authentication on it, then basically like this is the generic rundown how it should look like. So you would obviously want to have some uh, version negotiation between the client and the server because probably your protocol is not going to come out right at the first time so you will need to, need to have some versioning and the client and the server should be using like the same version of the or the dialect of the protocol oops we already at smb whatever uh, yeah so after uh, the version has been negoti negotiated then you will see uh, the authentication protocol negotiation this can be in the version negotiation as well uh, and when we both the client and the server agreed on authentication, then the I put it in a separate logical container. The authentication client and the authentication server are going to initialize, and usually uh, everything that these two generic like authentication concepts are wishing to, willing to communicate with each other are just going to be interposed on the actual network protocol. We are going to see it in like uh, in great detail uh, later on, uh, and this uh, back and forth of the out messages are going to going to go until the authentication either succeeds or not. Uh, obviously, like currently, we are not touch, uh, touching the authorization part uh, because we don't have like a day of explaining every single <laughs> bit and the uh, bit, um, uh, bit of information here. So. After the authentication is finished, then usually both the, uh, the client or the authentication client and the authentication server are going to end up with a shared secret. And this shared secret is, is uh, used or not used depending on what the protocol would like to, like the actual network protocol would like to, uh, to do in the future. Um, they have the option to use the shared secret to basically encrypt or protect the integrity of the protocol. So moving on, this is a continu uh, continuation of the uh, slides before. So authentication protocols, um, <coughs> the, sorry, so encryption and decryption, uh, user would like to list the shares, for example. Uh, it double clicks on, or like it types like slash slash IP address because we are still in the NTLM times and we don't want to use Kerberos anyhow. Um, this is going to be translated inside of the client to like a series of messages and these are plain text messages so uh, basically the client can request the authentication protocol to encrypt the message then the encrypted message is going to be dispatched to the server server is going to dispatch it to the authentication protocol which does the decryption and or the integrity verification and going to be like turtles all the way down from here uh, these encrypted and decrypted uh, calls are going to uh, go on till the protocol terminates or like the network connection terminates. So uh, here as I was explaining we are going to use LDAP as like a case study uh, because um, it supports like all the authentication protocols and more than um, um, that shows like the uh, generational weaknesses in I mean I would say I would say like um, in any single place but whatever we, we are we are going to the alcohol is hitting me we are we are going to we are going to see like uh, what uh, LDAP supports as authentication methods and how we can maybe proxify some of these uh, moving on yes so LDAP has uh, a Sicily authentication uh, how many of you are familiar with the Sicily authentication in LDAP 
yeah, I'm not really, I'm not really seeing many hands around here. So Sicily authentication is actually raw NTLM authentication that has been like forced inside of the LDAP protocol thanks to Microsoft because they, they when when they came up with this whole NTLM stuff, they wanted to like stuff it like literally everywhere, and this is like the, one of the main reasons why we cannot really get rid of it. Uh, so basically what is happening here is that like you can have like a root query before authentication that uh, basically explain like it's kind of like the version negotiation part then you have the bind request which, where you specify Sicily and if you want to check it in Wireshark this is the place where it where Wireshark fails basically the, the sector just fails because uh, not because of security issues but because like it's just like a, a Simply, a, simply put, a badly made, badly made protocol. So nobody is, uh, nobody is really using it, except for, um, for nefarious reasons. One, one, one might want, to, one might want to use it. Anyhow, so uh, bin request, bin response, NTLM client is going to uh, kick in. NTLM client, like the LDAP client, is going to ask the NTLM client, hey, like, do you, what is the first? structure that uh, that I need to send to the server so authentication can proceed and NTLM is going to say that's like okay like uh, let's negotiate no that that might be an issue there but point is that NTLM has like basically three data structures the uh, uh, the authenticate the challenge and the uh, negotiate yes okay then they, then it's negotiate sorry about that so basically like NTLM messages are being interposed on top of the LDAP protocol, passing them back and forth till the authentication finished. And then you have uh, a shared secret available and if for example like LDAP integrity, is, integrity protection is enabled, then this is the shared secret that is going to be used for either encrypt and or integrity protect your LDAP messages in the future. Okay. So, quick word about SPNego. Uh, SPNego is basically um, uh, an authentication protocol selector protocol. Uh, that's <laughs> that's a tongue twister uh, that supports uh, LDAP, Kerberos, the other type of Kerberos, and potentially it could support other authentication protocols as sub protocols. But mostly, like these are the like NTLM and Kerberos are the two main ones that are being used in in a normal day to day life. Uh, so SPNego itself does not provide um, uh, authentication. It is just a, a way for the client and the server to agree on an authentication protocol to be used in the future. And uh, one of the tidbits is that SPNego has um, uh, has an added integrity protection it in itself. So basically, it is to protect against downgrade attack, like not downgrade attacks, uh, depending on. If you think like NTLM is more secure or less secure than Kerberos, uh, but this integrity uh, integrity protection requires after the NTLM authentication finished as the sub authentication module to uh, use the secret key to sign the uh, SPNego uh, packet. Uh, that has been sent by the client from the server, so it verifies that the client, in fact, received like requested only NTLM authentication, and not somebody was doing it man in the middle and removing the Kerberos part from the uh, from the request. Um, yeah, so. LDAP. Uh, LDAP supports like these uh, the following three main authentication protocol classes. Uh, one is called simple. The simple can have uh, plain, which is like user and password. Obviously, there is no integrity protection and no like secret key exchange uh, after that because you are literally sending the username and plain text password. Uh, there is also none, which is we call anonymous bind. There is Sicily, which is like it still bugs me that it's it's still enabled everywhere and we have the SASL and inside of the SASL you can find SPNego and GSS API and uh, yeah uh, the external one is uh, is really really interesting because it basically the external one uh, presumes that you have created um, like an MTLS connection already to the LDAP server and the external does not provide any other information just it just says that's like hey I already authenticated but to you uh, but over um, over TLS or SSL so please like like verify that one and since I'm verified then just let me in and uh, this is really really useful if you are doing like ADCS attacks for uh, for example 
uh, depending. So, just a quick rundown on the on how the LDAP SASL SP Nego anti LM authentication works, and I believe uh, like this is going to be the most comple complex one. I'm, I'm, I'm I don't want to torture you <laughs> torture you further. So, basically. LDAP client kicks in, connects to the server uh, via TCP, uh, hopefully. Then there is some version negotiation with root, root, root query. Uh, SPNAGO client kicks in. SPNAGO client is going to like instruct the LDAP client to send basically the uh, supported uh, authentication protocols to the LDAP server. LDAP server is going to kick in the SPNAGO server saying that, hey, I got a new client. This is what they support. What should I reply? It should, uh, like the reply of the SPNAGO server is then interposed onto the LDAP client and LDAP client relays it to the SPNAGO client and you know, you, you get you get the gist. Like you don't you don't need to read it through. Uh, maybe at home because there's going to be a test tomorrow. So uh, how Kerberos authentication works? If Kerberos, if if we are not talking about um, um, mutual authentication for Kerberos, then it's going to be really simple. Uh, the reason why it is so simple is because like the actual Kerberos uh, communication is not being shown on this slide because like the complexity is done on the on the other side uh, at the other end. So basically, then LDAP is just basically using SPNego to instruct the Kerberos client to request uh, a ticket, and then they just send this ticket, and this ticket is already uh, con uh, this ticket already contains the uh, the shared secret. So <coughs> let's talk about uh, SMB encryption decryption uh, because it is a bit different than um, like um, Kerberos and normal NTLM. So. Um, Kerberos and NTLM themselves provide uh, encryption and decryption algorithms to be used, which are specified by RFC. And NTLM encryption decryption, uh, RFC, the errata is larger than the actual RFC. Uh, that should tell you something. Uh, but mostly, like, Besides LDAP, like not many other protocols are actually taking advantage of uh, NTLM encryption decryption, uh, probably because it's based on RC4, but I, I don't know that part. Um, yeah, so how SMB does it, however, is that SMB says that's like, oh, like it's really nice and cute that you are like defining your own RFC and your own encryption and decryption methods, but actually I am Microsoft, I don't really care about it. So how about just give me the secret key and I'll, I'll deal. I'll deal with the rest. Uh, this is like this is going to be like super important later for us when we are actually trying to rebuild some authentication context on our own machines. So uh, yeah, now Microsoft has this SSPI. SSPI is a set of APIs that. Uh, uh, are like that you can uh, that allows you to interface with ELSAS um, in a programmatical way, and SSPI is basically created uh, because, um, as some of you might know, ELSAS caches some credentials. Uh, I don't know if it's a big secret or not, but uh, yeah, it caches some credentials. Some like sometimes plain text, sometimes not really plain text credentials, but they are there. The reason why they are there is because you have like a millions of uh, like a million processes running on your computer in a Windows domain environment, and these processes ad hoc want to connect to the DC or to some other servers. And yeah, it's not really nice if we ping. Uh, the user every time uh, when a random background process wishes to authenticate to the DC just to get the uh, the credentials uh, every single time. So SSPI is the the way that like a userland application or userland process would uh, perform like an authentication, either with or without the user consent or. Yeah, they don't really care about consent in uh, in this part, but like there there is uh, there is a way to set it up that it prompts the user. But like, why would you use, why would you use that if you are on the attacker side, of course? So uh, SSPI uh, defines a kind of handful of uh, of API calls, but for the sake of this discussion, uh, we we can only we only need to take five into account. Uh, acquire credential handle, initialize security context, context query, uh, query context attributes, encrypt and decrypt message. This is this is how we roll. Like if you if you have like a legit or an, an illegit uh, process, 
um, then you this is this is all the only the five that you would need to that you would need to implement to to get uh, the authentication action rolling. So again, generalization: how it looks like. So basically, client would like to contact uh, connect to the uh, would like to authenticate to the server. So client on its own end is going to first invoke acquire credential handle uh, that is going to create like an authentication context like on the ELSAS <coughs> ELSAS level. Uh, then for every single like authentication message that uh, that needs to be passed uh, between the client and the server, the client is going to constantly invoke the initialized security context part. Uh, up till uh, to the point where the initialized security context actually uh, from the client part comes back to the to the network client and says this like okay we are finished and like I believe that we have like a good good go at this this authentication part. So if the result is okay then uh, there is going to be a shared secret like the shared secret that we were explaining in the in the general overview. This shared secret however is going to be kept in the ALSAS process or uh, something uh, like no it's probably it's in that uh, like it is in the ALSAS process sorry. Uh, and then <coughs> there is a problem so like so far so good because like you are not uh, you're not not an, an, an administrator or some high integrity process so you cannot get out these keys. However, uh, there is actually an API call uh, because what happens if for example, in SMB's case, SMB decides to implement their own encryption and decryption algorithms, and they would need to have the key for that, like the shared key, right? What happens if, like, mm, like some, like my process would like to have that as well? So, therefore, we have uh, the query context attributes uh, API call, which you can invoke after the authentication has finished successfully. And the query context attribute, like um, yeah, this API, I'm not going to say it again, uh, is actually there to query like a lot of different aspects of the current authentication context. And one of these aspects is to actually give you back the secret key, like the shared key that has been uh, generated based on like either Kerberos or NTLM or Credit SP, whatever. And this is super useful for us, actually, because, um, yeah. Almost, almost. So this is super useful for us because uh, what we can do here is that uh, now, like we can, like from our machine, can instruct Elsas to perform authentication for us. So authentication is done. What we need is the uh, is the secret key, and we can now request like we can request Elsas to give us the secret key. Well, what happens um, if like we can we do it remotely? I mean, like, it's just like four API calls. So, like, if you build like an RPC that is wrapping these four or five API calls, then uh, you should be golden, right? Now, there is uh, there is a kind of a problem because <laughs> there is a special uh, a spe a special case that uh, like Kerberos mutual authentication. In Kerberos mutual authentication, uh, you will need to have like. In any way, sorry, uh, you will need to have not just the secret key but also the IV. But how are you going to get the IV? The query contest attributes API does not uh, tell you the IV at all. And uh, in normal, like in, in normal situations, like in NTLM, you don't need the IV. <laughs> because it's RC4, so why would you need an IV? Uh, for Kerberos case, the IV, if it's not mutual, then you can read it out from the ticket itself. But if it's a mutual authentication, that means that like the the actual client and the server are going to do like another round trip of uh, of exchanging tickets, then the uh, the session key, like the uh, the ticket that uh, finally you end up with in the client, is going to contain the IV, but you cannot decrypt that uh, that part of the ticket that contains the IV, and Alsus doesn't give you that. So this this gave me a, a bit of a like a hard time. Uh, to figure out, but then it clicked on me. Uh, basically, we have the like the encrypt message and decrypt message. So taking the encrypt message is going to wrap our data, whatever data that we are encrypting, uh, in a token, and that token must have the current initiali uh, initialization vector. Otherwise, like the other side would not be able to decrypt it, right? So uh, this was the the missing piece of the puzzle. Now we have basically we can out like we can make 
else's authenticate, we can have the initialization vector, and we can have the secret key as well. So, your else's, but on my machine. The goal is basically to create wrappers for these four uh, API calls, well, sorry, uh, five API calls, and uh, that is the easy part. The hard part is that uh, now you have two choices. Now you either need to uh, modify your own attacking machine's ALSIS process to, to interface with this, to, to be uh, leveraging this uh, new, newly created like RPC, or you would rewrite each and every single like authentication protocol that you want to deal with. And since I love uh, authentication protocols, guess what, where I ended up. Uh, so it took, I would say, like roughly two years. Uh, but yeah, so I came up with an authentication library that, like, for Python, that is like um, um, that is used by all of my like network implementations that leverages these type of uh, uh, like RPC calls. Uh, how does it look like? So again, you don't have to read it. Oh, it's actually. Okay, I like, kind of like how it turned out. Basically, what you're seeing here is that uh, you, uh, can, um, uh, you can uh, perform these, uh, these RPC calls. I'm not going to go over each and every step because I don't want to make this presentation one and a half hours long. Uh, the final part of, uh, of this is, I'm sorry, yes. Yes. So basically, uh, what we were discussing before is that uh, there are like two ways that you can do the encryption decryption part. Because my first instinct, since I could not get the IV out, uh, any uh, like I could not figure out how to get the IV, what I did is that's like for each and every encrypt and decrypt message call, I was performing yet yet another set of RPC calls to inject back the encrypted data from my machine back to the victim's machine and make the else's decrypt this and send back the the raw data. Now, this is not really the, uh, the um, let's say, it's not really a useful solution because it just hogs the, the, the bandwidth. However, here what you have is that uh, with this, uh, for, uh, with the uh, previously explained get session key and then encrypt message with some random message and unwrapping the, the response token, you can basically have the entire encryption and decryption context back in your home machine from, uh, from, the, target, from the victim's target machine. So uh, I'm, I would like to show you two uh, use cases for it. Uh, actually, multiple use cases, but like two, which I have a demo for. One is, oh, how, how, does it get, uh, how did it get here? Sorry. Uh, one is uh, just basically uh, the proof of concept code is going to be executed on the victim's machine and then from another machine we are going to perform uh, an authentication to the domain controller. Uh, just a sec. Let's hope that the codec works this time. Uh, 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 uh. I see the video here, just a sec. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, that's nice because now I have to look over here. Just a second. Okay. So the attacker machine is on top. It's a Ubuntu machine, and the victim machine is, uh, is on the bottom. So at first we are just going we are just going to show that like we are not uh, administrators we are not like in a highly privileged uh, uh, users group and then if everything finished then we are going to execute this uh, proxy binary and this proxy binary let's stop here this proxy binary uh, currently is just like listening on the port on the victim machine obviously this is not the way that you would do it in a real life scenario this is just for proof of proof of concept sake and yeah on the target machine what you see here is that uh, basically uh, V told the library, the uh, SMB library, to, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, we told the SMB library to, like, not to use any, like, uh, actual credentials, but to use 
the username, uh, like sorry, the the IP, like the uh, RPC server on the IP address and port that uh, of the victim machine. And as soon as basically I executed the, like I gave the instruction. Let's just go back to the URL quickly, if we can. Oh, sorry, here. Pop, pop. So uh, on top, basically, that is the only information that the SMB client is uh, is using. So we have the IP address of the target machine uh, two times, basically, because no, just one time. Sorry, uh, and uh, the port is uh, by by default. It's set to something. Doesn't really matter. So the point is, SMB connection is going to basically work immediately, and we can. Oops. Yeah. Sorry we can perform an authentication here. Thank you. So yeah, it's just like I, I deliberately printed out all the debug data so mm, we, can, uh, we can see what is happening there. And for the other protocol is basic, oops, sorry, going back there. So just to, just to show that it actually works, so like it lists the shares, and I can like we can actually download the file from the from the destination. Yes. So that was for SMB, and we have one for uh, one for LDAP as well, and that should be coming soon. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, basically, the, the command is exactly the same, and yeah, we logged in uh, to the DC uh, via LDAP, and here we are listing the uh, the SPN, like the Kerberos to be users uh, for the time being. Okay, uh, sorry, I just need to speed it up because uh, times is of the essence. So. Yeah, that was the first demo. So uh, this was one use case. The second use case is that basically you can uh, use this technique by grabbing a Raspberry Pi, uh, like a single one. Uh, you can make it a USB dongle. Uh, you can add some clever techniques to make it uh, act as a keyboard, like a rubber ducky, for example, and also to act as a USB Ethernet device. If you set up a DHCP server, a Wi-Fi access point, whatever, then you can create a really, really neat attack tool for, uh, with it. Because, uh, as we have seen it in the previous slides, this technique does not require the attacker to know anything uh, prior about the target domain. If, it, if there is a user account that is actually active and the user is, uh, has executed this proxy library, then Everything else can happen, like uh, all the authentication and all the attacks are happening from another machine, okay? And the basic domain informations can be can be pulled, for example, like the set logon server, like where is the logon server or whatnot. And since all users can pull information from the LDAP, then it just basically tr trickles down, and you don't need to to add any. Uh, you don't need to, like if you have an embedded system, you don't need to add any specific, like target specific code. This means that like if you put everything together in, an, in a small Raspberry Pi, which is kind of like on the desk, for example, then what you are going to end up with is uh, like a pawn everything toolkit. <laughs> because if the proxy is going to is uh, successfully uh, executed, and the way that it's being executed is that if you plug it in, uh, I'm just going to go on a ramble. Sorry. So, if you if you plug this device in, then it's going to show itself to the target machine, an unlocked target machine. What is going to show itself as a keyboard, like an HID keyboard, and a um, USB Ethernet device, right? With the HID keyboard your attacker code, like just like with the rubber ducky, you control the key code, you can instruct the machine to execute the binary, like the proxy binary, and the proxy binary is not going to go out to the internet because you don't know if there is an internet or not on the target machine, but what you know is that it has access to at least one network because you provided this network to it via the Raspberry Pi. And then this proxy machine can connect back to the Raspberry Pi, and then 
whatever application is running ins uh, inside of this Raspberry Pi can immediately leverage the user authentication context uh, of the uh, of the target machine. So basically, like with some clever engineering, uh, uh, with this technique, you can do like a, a pawn all uh, Raspberry Pi that works on air gap networks as well. Like it, the, the target doesn't need to have any ty any type of access to the internet. So demo. Uh-huh. Any minute now. Okay. Oh, oh, stop, 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 stop. Okay. This is the victim's machine. The victim's machine is currently just like a... Okay, thank you. Uh, the victim's machine is basically just a standard Windows 10 machine and uh, I have plugged in this device. Like, you will have to believe me, I wanted to do it on the stage, but they told me that it's, it's probably better to have video of, of everything. So what are we going to see now is that uh, we have to wait till it boots, and then virtual keyboard immediately starts ex executing the code. The actual, like, uh, reverse proxy binary is served via HTTP uh, from the HTTP server of the Raspberry uh, device as well. And, oh, yes, at this point, uh, what you would see is that uh, the proxy is executed, and you will see two host names and port addresses. Those, uh, those two host names are the uh, Active Directory server and over the LDAP port. Yeah, it's too small. I, I'd be able to make it bigger, but oops, no. Yeah, but this is this is not the point. The point comes afterwards. So, what we can do is a bit of clever engineering. We can open the browser now. Usually, this is not what you would do on the target machine. This is what you would do somewhere else. Where is the somewhere else? Since I explained that the Raspberry Pi has a Wi-Fi like an access point, this service that I'm going to open. Oops. What happened? Oh yeah. So this service is actually my. Um, Octopon project. Um, I was explaining Octopon on Area 41, like DEFCON Switzerland, uh, a year ago. And uh, this Octopon integrates this attack technique uh, into itself. So, what we are seeing here is that basically we already have uh, a lot of information available to us via the tool because. Uh, like between the time that the re the proxy connected back to Octopon's uh, like handler server and the time that I opened <laughs> opened this, the automation immediately started uh, um, enumerating the domain. So what we are seeing here is uh, like there is some SMB browser as well. So like the SMB connection is working. There is no the, and there was there has been absolutely no prior like user secret uh, um, configured on this device. And we are going to perform a Kerber hosting soon. So we have this is the uh, this part is the handler handler of the agent, like the reverse uh, reverse proxy agent. And uh, currently, like Kerber hosting is uh, set as a separate entity. So if I I'm going to basically instruct the Kerberos logic to use the already you already created LDAP session that has been created by the proxy authentication to the target uh, domain via the uh, proxy library. Uh, it will basically allow me to perform uh, Kerberos thing uh, on the target machine and then basically like we have all the uh, all the Kerberos tickets that we can send to Hashcat to crack. And Okay, tickets. Oh, speed up a little. Who made this video? Okay, yeah. And what is, what uh, what is happening here on this session while we were Kerber hosting? It also started uh, on, on uh, domain enumeration over LDAP and SMB, uh, which is basically uh, not Bloodhound, but Bloodhound. So, like, I basically I rewrote Bloodhound in Python from scratch uh, just for this. So, what we are going to see here is. Uh, that 
there's going to be a cut, and after uh, after the enumeration has finished, uh, we just like I'm listing here. That's like all the uh, IP addresses and ports that uh, the uh, the tool is being uh, the the tool is connecting to right now. And yeah, we did the SMB enumeration since it's a virtual domain. There is not many. There aren't many SMB hosts. And this is actual. Uh, exp uh, this is the representation layer. Uh, of the tool, like my Bloodhound implementation, it's called Jagdo, and we can see that it's already like loading in the database that was generated from the other session. And soon, if it's loaded, what we are going to end up with is a canvas, hopefully. Any second now. Yes, canvas, and then here are all the paths to the domain administrator group. After. Yes, here you go. And this is fully automated. Thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, I have some other slides as well, but uh, this is basically the gist of it. And I hope you have, ooh, sorry. Uh, I hope you have some questions, so I think we can. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, really quickly, uh, I would like to do some shout outs. Hopefully, the persons are in, inside of this room. So, uh, there, is a few, there is future research to be done with this one because I don't want you, to, uh, I don't want you people to be forced using my tools. Uh, everything, by the way, except for the Octopon part, everything is going to be open source. It is actually op already open sourced. I, I published it yesterday. No, today uh, afternoon. And uh, the future of this research uh, would be uh, the, um, uh, to have basically like all Windows-based tools uh, um, leveraging this type of technique, which can be done. And there was a gentleman, hopefully he's here, uh, called Ethical Chaos. And a few years ago, he created a tool. And this tool is basically... Uh, uh, allows like uh, it hooks every single like processes on your like uh, attacker machine and overtakes uh, the SSPI calls or like not just the SSPI calls but like it could used to be overtaking the SSPI calls as well. This is some modification needed and it could be integrated in, uh, like it could be used with this technique that would allow basically like every already existing Windows process. On your target, on your attacker Windows machines, your PowerShell scripts, your uh, SQL browser, whatever, uh, to leverage this technique, so you don't have to deploy these scripts uh, on the remote end, and it would be really nice to do. However, I have my own platform, so thank you very much. I already uh, put like a lot of, lot of time <laughs> into this one, but if somebody uh, would like to do it, then yes. Uh, go for it. Uh, just hit me up. I can I can help if you need. The other shout out is that uh, the other uh, future research that can be done is that there are a handful of other API calls that can be added here to support Peaky, to support Peaky in it and other like uh, Windows Hello like certificate based services to uh, basically use the exact same type of uh, uh, of like authentication proxying, which might be interesting. <clears throat> Interesting. I am going to work on this part definitely uh, uh, because I know at least one person who might be really interested in this. And yes, so uh, thank you for everybody who is on these slides. Uh, your research has uh, has helped me tremendously. And also, here are the links uh, with all the like open source tools that uh, that you have seen here. Uh, on this talk, the wsnet-dotnet is the uh, is the actual like proxy that has been that has been used here and uh, QA time, if we have time. Uh, there is a gentleman next to the camera. That I that I for sure see. Well, I mean, like currently, no, because it is like uh, it's a being a bin, like I don't know the English name for it, but like the, what, what this process does is similar to any other other process that would use uh, uh, SSPI uh, would be doing. 
So like there is no uh, no like nefarious running around here. Uh, also like it's a fresh tool, so <laughs> you know like maybe maybe in two in maybe in two hours it will be detected. I wouldn't know. But I I already implemented it in Rust and Nim, but I'm not going to provide that part. So. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Thank you very much.